2020 about this giant flaming dumpster fire of a world we now live in and to be able to see an alternative perspective to the RIA, the IFPI, Netflix and John Gormley and other corporate media of various kinds. And today I have, as previous weeks, a special guest, someone who I'm very pumped to actually talk to for the first time over a voice channel, uh, Daniel Levy. Daniel, are you still there? Aloha, I am. So so happy to talk to you, Jeff. Daniel is in Hawaii and is Hawaii is kind of notable for one reason right now and this is something I wasn't aware of until just a couple of minutes ago here but apparently it's one of the few places in the world that is COVID free right now is that correct have I got that one right that is correct uh, to my knowledge we have no active cases on the island we haven't had any new cases in about a week and I believe the cases that we did have were from people that traveled here and we currently have a mandatory 14-day quarantine on the island. So anybody that arrives, they go right into quarantine. I believe the one new case was somebody that had arrived was quarantined. So. And, and so like they were Looking discovered to be us. live COVID case while in quarantine, so they could be properly dealt with, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was all taken care of appropriately, and that's kind of how it was supposed to unfold. So I mean, any, any, any new people... They're in quarantine automatically. I mean, it, it is a little bit easier when you have over a thousand kilometers of water on every side of you to stay socially isolated from the rest of humanity. But still, Hawaii has managed to do this. And it is proven, like there's a lot of people in my life that are saying, oh, COVID is now just part of life. And we have to accept these limitations on our personal freedom and our ability to do things, uh, to live life as normal forever for the rest of history because it's never going to get any better. And yet, here in Hawaii, we have a, a case of it has gotten better. Oh, Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, things are starting to reopen a little bit. We, st- we have maybe stricter rules here still than other places. Like, we have mandatory masks in grocery stores and public markets, things like that. We have to wear masks. They have mandatory social distancing rules. A certain number of people in the grocery stores so people wait in line outside have to hand you know sanitize hands before we're still very active in our measures to uh, keep this thing at bay but yeah i mean people here are really celebrating i think a lot of people are uh, loosening up a little bit uh, as far as uh, being, like connecting with their friends maybe right. giving hugs to their friends I've, I've certainly been hugging some of my friends that I, i'm used to being close with all the time and i've been doing a little bit of massage work again which is something that I've always you know, done for a while. And, and like that uh, is definitely cause of celebration. Like that that is a big accomplishment, yeah. even though like the global threat is still there. And you're going to have to have these 14 day uh, quarantines mm-hmm. for a good time to come. It's worth having that celebration and having something for the rest of us to look forward to. <laughs> And, like, you have this That's project true. called uh, Humandelas, uh, and mm-hmm. so this, this is actually going to be a relevant thing here. Now, before we get it, too it, much it into it, it is very relevant. What exactly <laughs> yeah. are Humandelas, and how is, what are you, what is your involvement? Sure, so Humandelas, Humandelas, Humandela are a group movement meditation activity. So it's a technique that I've been developing for about 
15 years and it guided meditations to help people get more in sync with one another, get more in sync with nature. It's a co-visioning process. Get in harmony with the rhythms of nature, get in harmony with each other and start our collaboration from that space Adherence. Now, most Q models are done with physical connections, hand connections. It's like intricate handshakes. So, uh, you know, lately, kind of you know, like had a peer to peer uh, handshake almost. Like a, a mass what? handshake would be one way of looking at it. A little bit more. Handshake, which are like Ill illegal now in most places, I think. But it was fun while it lasted. <laughs> no. I mean, I, I still do humongous online. We can connect to each other through the rhythms of nature. We don't have to connect physically to get in harmony with each other. But there's something to be said for connecting physically. I think it's core to our being as humans, connecting physically. And to connect physically in a way that's safe and there's no unknowns with it. You know, it's a safe space to connect physically where there's no unknowns. You're not going to be triggered by someone touching outside of the rules uh, sort of the, thing the rules yeah. right you know it's all pretty guided it's a great opportunity to get that connection need met yeah and, and i think a, there's a lot of people who are, who are feeling that need for connection right now and a lot of people are really really craving human contact and, and physical love and, and i don't mean like physical love in a sexual way but like hugs being in the presence of people where you're comfortable with them in an organized way and i'm probably gonna again mispronounce it but no i'm, I'm not even gonna try I can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> however you pronounce it so if somebody humandala some people are humandala uh, I don't, if you were saying something else, dude. Yeah. Like, it's it's one of those words I've read like a million times, so it's deeply encoded in my mind by now. But uh, so you have this group of people that you do this with and that are organized in this very friendly, loving way. And so, among other things, you have been trying to get them to communicate and organize online, right? Oh, yeah. I think of myself as like a social, I, I, I use the word social permaculture. So it's like, we want to create whole circuit systems all our life, whether it be food, whether it be our homesteading lifestyles and sustainability. But the most important thing to sustainability, to, to thriving, is really acknowledging and and working on our interdependence and learning how to collaborate with each other better, learning how to trust one another better, learning how to go deeper with one another without it being scary, right? Or right. necessarily sexual or whatever it might be. How do we go deeper with one another? How do we trust, learn to trust each other more? How do we build more resilience as a community? How do we come together from a space of trust, from a space of coherence? where we can actually communicate our needs, where we can actually communicate our visions, right? Where we can actually like co-create together in harmony. That's really the vision with Humandalas. I teach a couple of other workshops too. Unfortunately, all of them are halted right now and they are still not allowed in our state for at least a, another month, I don't know, maybe in the next phase they'll allow, will be allowing workshops that involve physical connection. Right now, workshops that involve physical connection are illegal. So we're dealing with that. Oh, my other workshops are a contact improv, which is an improvisational form of dance. It involves lots of contact and connection. And acro yoga is the other workshop I teach, which is a form of partner yoga that's a little acrobatic. Very of all of them, I'm like a connection guy. I'm like, how do we connect more? How do we uh, psychically, physically, spiritually, digitally, right? How do we have, have you seen more? a telecomics's uh, telejucha? Uh, description or have you encountered that idea at all yet? Can you share more? I don't know if I'm familiar. Yeah, telecomics is kind of like this anarchist internet movement thing. Kind of hard to put it in a category, but they have some ideals that they strive to. And one of them I find kind of interesting is this idea of telejucha. And what telejucha is, telejucha is based off of the North Korean ideal of this jucha thing, which is their central uh, governing thing of their whole worldview, from what I understand. But telejucha kind of takes that and abstracts it a little bit, and then uses it to basically uh, have as a value, as something that you find personally valuable, the connection of others. And so that if you are the person in your life that helps the people in your life connect to each other over technology, that is a telejucha act. And that it is something where you can enjoy, you can find value in doing just that, independent of any other value that you have 
and they see it as kind of like a really important value. I could agree. But you seem to have this in buckets, right? Like you've got yeah. all these projects. You're involved with Ripple, and you've got this human dollars. Which is a, a got, trust trust building project. Yeah, well, right? it's, it's got its trust building aspects and the management of trust, and that, that part is an important part of it. But in your specific case, you are the focal point of a lot of different people, a lot of potential for other people to be working together and learning to trust each other. And that in itself, that's the value, I, at least as far as intelligence is concerned. Now, as far as the, the trust and being able to create things, I, I just want to point out here that, I mean, the context we are talking, uh, having this conversation, uh, there is all kinds of strife and rebellion and violence happening around the United States and spreading into Canada right now. But one of the people in my life actually had their neighborhood burned down and looted and ransacked and basically destroyed. And the conversation that came out of that I found was kind of interesting because it seems that we are losing the ability to see that what allowed us to be, to have as much, one of the things that allowed as much prosperity in the United States, especially, to happen is that there's a ability to create when people start working together. Now, it, it can be a predatory working together, obviously. It can be an unfair working together. There's lots of reasons why the United States <laughs> is imperfect, specifically, and Canada, of course. But like just this trust that we have at a baseline level that allows us to create, that allows us to get close. It's like we are losing sight of that at a very quick rate right now. And so it's important to have the, this voice here, I think, to remind us that yes, it is possible to work together and it is possible to love one another and to have these institutions, to have these cultural practices or whatever that allow us to get close to each other. So as far as the the protests, uh, one of the things that happened this week, I'm just going to do a quick recap here, uh, and you can oh, correct God. me if I'm wrong, <laughs> is there was a police officer who, from all accounts, murdered a black gentleman in Minnesota, and stood on his neck until he couldn't breathe, and then sat there for eight or nine minutes until he died. People have been... Uh, three three officers, three officers were three. on him, were sitting. Okay, so there were three officers involved for sure, three officers on him, there was, the guy died. And the guy died in plain view of people with cameras in broad daylight on a city street that, I mean, you wouldn't normally expect to see someone just murdered in that way. Peaceful protests followed very quickly, following the same pattern of Black Lives Matter a couple of years back. Those peaceful protests were very, very quickly and very, very violently suppressed. And the video that is coming out from all directions of that initial violent repression, again, just spread the seeds of hate and spread this violence and gave us what we're at today, which is that cities are on fire, we've got police are getting basically lynched, we have the independent people just trying to protect their businesses from looters, getting beaten up and really, really badly beaten up. We have, uh, they saw somebody murdered for protecting their business. Yeah, like it's, and that, again, that's focusing on just the one aspect of so many different directions of yeah. violence that are happening right now. And so this is what is going on in America today. Now, as far as from your perspective, nothing of this has, has really hit Hawaii yet, right? right. And so yeah, I mean, I, I know that there's a uh, Black Lives Matter rally in Hilo, but our police here are so chill. I can say, like, last night I was at a, out on post, a uh, friend uh, set up, I uh, was playing some music, and some people down on the coast. So I, I was there and a couple of cop car, police cars pulled up and you know, all of us were all like, ah, <laughs> you know, we're all like freaked out from police watching the news this week. But, you know, uh, and, you know, please say, hey, can I talk to you? And we're like, oh, we don't talk to police. I'm sorry. He's like, oh, please, please. I, there's a missing person. You know, it's like he wasn't even able to ask us about the, these miss, a missing person because we were all freaked out. It was really concerning. Yeah. But, you know, I could see here in Hawaii, it's a different vibe. Our police officers are really 
for, at least out here in our small town, they're really chill and really sweet people mostly. And like, it was just interesting dynamic, really kind of having that hesitant feeling to even talk to this police officer, but realizing that, oh, he's looking for missing 15 year old girl that right. he's just like searching the woods trying to find someone who's lost mental health issues or something and like yeah it, it was just reminder good reminder it's like okay no these guys that's like guys are here to help their community to benefit their community to uplift their community and i i, I think it's just a few bad apples hopefully not spoiling the whole barrel but i, I it, it's so crazy though it, and it's, it's also so kind of watch. interesting to see that like when that trust is eroded when the cops have go into this kind of panic mode and one of the things that i saw this, this past uh, couple of hours is there's a video of a neighborhood where they're just walking through the neighborhood, shooting at people kind of in their house, almost in their houses, like people with the door uh, open, watching the cops to see what they're to get back in. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that video. Yeah. Like th just examples like that, where like these cops probably do mean well, and they're probably just trying to get uh, in control of a situation that's clearly out of control. Going crazy. Yeah. But like at the same control. time, like they're in this group and the group action mm -hmm. starts to take over. And we are at this point far, far into that process where they have rules that they follow. The guidelines of the people around them are leading to some very destructive activity taking place. But like, there's so much destructive activity taking place on so many <laughs> levels and scales right now. It's yeah. kind of hard to know where to it's start. It's hard to it's hard to expect civilians to uh, stay under control when the police are unable to. That's a, the, the whole thing is very, very difficult to watch. You know, I only hope that it's not escalated by our that and that would make lots of words to de-escalate the situation, help people come to terms, see the humanity in one another, and we're all just people, whether police or or African American or whatever, you know, we're all just people trying to get along. No. You know, we gotta find trust, we gotta see each other eye to eye, breathe together. That's it, oh, right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's intense for me. It's intense to watch. I feel so grateful to be in Hawaii. And also, I would like, part of me wishes I could be over there just holding holding a peaceful space in these chaotic places. I know during during the Occupy movement, that I felt like that was a big role of mine, was I was at the Occupy Oakland march, and you know, anytime the march would stop, a big group of us, maybe 30 of us, and I don't know who started it with me and my friends, just to see each other, people dive in, but anytime the march would stop, there would be like 20 or 30 of us that would just sit and meditate together, praying for peace, radiating beauty and blissful feelings and energy for all of those around us, and trying to see the light in everybody around us, it's really just like holding space as uh, beacons of positivity and peacefulness, in, even though we might be surrounded by a lot of chaos, uh, the reflection really impacts people pretty uh, profoundly, you know, the reflection of one person just being totally at peace or as much as possible in that type of situation, right? Right. We reflect each other. We're just mirrors of one another, uh, generally. So I, I, the police, the people, everybody, it just calms everybody down. So that would be my, like, encouragement. Most the people out there on the streets, they aren't watching this probably. And <laughs> a lot of them, their phones are probably dead and whatever. But, uh, uh oh, we have yeah, no sound. That That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. But you know, seek peace. We're all uh, seeking peace. Peace comes from within. We, we gotta find that peace in ourselves, or we can uh, bring peace to the world. And if you're pushing a peaceful narrative to the world and you haven't found peace in yourselves, there you're pushing an egotistic narrative that is probably bringing more chaos. Okay, a lot uh, of time. hold, hold so, on for a second. We apparently have no sound. So although we have one thing that's recording here, I'm just going to see if I can find the sound settings very quickly here. And then probably we're going to restart this stream. We're going to keep going in the, the conversation here, but I'm just going to take a quick uh, see what is going on with the sound break. And you're live streaming onto This YouTube? is live stream onto Facebook right now. Oh, okay. I think I have you on Facebook. I'll put all sure. you on here. You use uh, open, what do you call it? You use OBS or? Uh, actually, I've thought about using OBS because I have like an OBS studio. It is installed, but like the uh, the setup so far, like I can use OBS to stream to Twitch, and I think Facebook can do OBS too. Although the I mean, you can do you can stream to Facebook too. Yeah. Like using OBS to stream to Facebook seems like a little overkill since there's already like a built-in stream to Facebook available, but it just. 
takes a little bit because this Chromebook is getting a little old. It's, I think, due to be completely not usable in 2022, but it's already they starting. Go, you go pretty quick. I yeah. think a couple of years is all you get. And, uh, what's your What's your name on Facebook? Uh, it's Jeff Cliff, I believe. Because I don't think I have you there. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not connected with you on Facebook yet. We'll do that. Okay, we are now back live as of now. Uh, hopefully somebody listening to this can tell us if we're actually still broadcasting and or live audio and if the audio is in fact working because it is kind of important to have audio in a podcast <laughs> it is one of the important things about it uh, so we, before we kind of got cut off there though we were talking about facebook and how the people or rather we were talking about how people get reflected back at them kind of their environment and you can choose to a large extent, maybe not entirely, but you can choose with meditation or otherwise to be a source of peace and to be that stable point that people around you can rely on to be a mindful presence of those around you. And your example was good because it was in the middle of a protest. So it's not like you can't protest or you can't go out and, and do things in the real world that have an effect. And I would even include things like burning down buildings, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of like a really extreme thing. And I'm not saying I mean, legally, I don't think I can say that you should do No, that. don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's, there's lots of activity you can do while still being in control and having some degree of do, not just doing it because there's this opportunity there to do it and you can go and steal that, that diamond necklace because you can, right? There are actions that you can take in your life. And if the mob you're part of is out there protesting and it's becoming not peaceful, again, we can get into that. But it's important to have the one person at least who's trying to not let things get totally and utterly out of control. Yeah, you can bring peace to the situation yeah. by being peace. Okay, we are now being uh, heard. Perfect. Okay, keep going. Yeah. And it's another time, like, uh, like I said, this example that we gave was during the uh, Occupy Oakland marches and protests when we shut down the, uh, the dock there. We shut down commerce for the day. It's a pretty big deal if, if you remember that. And, and every time our march would stop, a big group of us, 30 or so, would just sit and meditate, you know, radiate the most beautiful energy, the most blissful feelings that we possibly could and try and reflect peace you know, in everything we see, see the beauty in one another, see the beauty in the world around us. And it reflects in everyone's eyes. You know, people catch your eyes and they smile. You know, you smile at someone, they're going to smile back. The feelings are contagious, whether it's sad feelings or blissful or just a simple yawn. You know, you yawn, it's like that feels good. Everybody else around you wants to yawn. Right. If you chuckle, you just chuckle. I, people around you are going to chuckle, even if they don't even know what the joke was. People, you know, you've seen that happen where it's like people are laughing. Other people are going to start laughing. They, don't, they might not even know what the joke was, but they're going to laugh with you. Some people are. So the more peace that we can hold in ourselves, the more the more peace we're going to see in our world around us. That's really uh, peace within, right? That's so, the old saying, right? So one of the things <laughs> that is definitely contagious, and I, I, I do kind of want to get to this point here, is there's a lot of what makes us human that is evolved out of avoiding disease. And we have really, really strong disgust reactions. We have really, really strong contagious reactions that involve the possibility of getting sick, the possibility of other people getting us sick. There's all kinds of evolved parts of us that are ready to handle that sort of thing. And it is worth pointing out that COVID is still a problem in the continental United States and in Canada and here in Saskatoon and elsewhere. We are not like Hawaii in that we have not finished dealing with this problem yet. And we're still dealing with it here too. You know? Yeah, exactly. I, and it's not going to go away today and it's not going to go away tomorrow and it's not going to go away in the next two weeks. But one of the things that really, really makes COVID worse is mass events of large numbers of people not keeping distance from each other. I mean, there's not wearing a mask is part of it, but like the just the fact of not being around a lot of other people. This virus is able to spread through the air, through droplets, from our breath. It is able to spread very easily, and even though not everybody gets it, a significant portion of the people who, who get it either die or become really, really critically injured in a way. Just the treatment of it itself does damage to your your lungs, your ability to breathe. Your like we, we, these the, cause permanent lung scarring, all yeah. kinds of permanent issues as well. And when we start looking at the, the rhetoric that's going around right now of the we can all breathe or we all, we all should be breathing or you know I can't breathe or whatever the, the when we start looking at that specific 
specifically, it is worth keeping in mind that we have this problem uh, that is going to keep a lot of people, it's kept well over 100,000 Americans, from breathing. And we can deal with it as a continent, as a species, as a culture, as a group, as friend groups. But right now, this week, people are choosing not to deal with that problem. And they're choosing to a large extent of doing other things. And now I understand if there are people who are willing to die for a better deal in the United States for African Americans or whatever, that those people are, it's hard to argue against to say, oh no, you shouldn't go out in the streets and protest, even though you're likely going to kill people by doing so. But at the same time, people should be very mindful of what they are doing and very, very aware in a sense that I don't think a lot of people are this week today right now and so this being able to reflect on ourselves and being able to see ourselves in our activity in this way one of the things that seems to be keeping us from doing so effectively is Facebook and we were talking a little bit before we started about how like you're always kind of like one foot out of Facebook and your friend group is trying to leave so as far as getting out of Facebook how has that been for you so far? <laughs> good leeway, good leeway. So, so right now I am working with a group of people to create our own instance of Mastodon, our own Mastodon instance. A lot of people on Facebook, I, I have had a couple of friends on Facebook who have been banned recently for sharing, I'll do the quotes, right, but medical misinformation, quote unquote, for sharing that, you know, medical misinformation in private chats, not just on their feed. I have a friend that was banned, no warning, anything like that from Facebook for sending medical misinformation privately in chats. And he was actually just asking his knowledgeable friend what they thought of this article. I might have had a different opinion about the article he shared. You know, I'm kind of like super turned off by a lot of the Facebook drudgery going on right now. There's just so much real misinformation going on and right. crazy crazy, crazy stuff being posted by a But this is like what we should be doing, right? Like, we have the people in our lives that we've managed to build up trust with, and people who have managed to dedicate enough of their life to being experienced in how the human body works and understanding the, the issues involved in being healthy, and I would include you in that in terms of emotional health, for sure. And, like, when people are have something that they need information about we have this network that facebook has built uh, maybe not for us but certainly allowing us to use that allows us to connect to one another and the obvious thing to use this network for is to ask the people who we trust oh hey this thing uh this theory about how covid affects the lungs maybe is it true is it something that we can believe in or, or maybe test is it important to spread this or maybe all kinds of information we could have about this and that is the point where it is getting censored right yeah. and the only yeah, possible right. outcome of this is going to be ignorance right and distrust and not being able to build that trust with the people in our lives it's it's terrible in a way but continue well so on mastodon is interesting because it is is a federated network and each instance kind of creates their own code of conduct. You, you're not just keeping on there. It's not on a blockchain or anything where it's uncensored, right? right. It's like a uh, federated, it's kind of like super moderated. Honestly, it's like a uh, way more moderated than Facebook would be, but it's moderated by your community, moderated by an algorithm. It's not moderated by a big corporation. It's moderated by your friend. If somebody posts some, uh, something on our new instance, well, I'll, I'll say too, our new instance is private invite only. Uh, and we have very specific rules that it's really like a good news only type of site. I mean, not just good news, but you're, you're, you can post, you're you know, focusing on that. With a focus on that. Yeah, it's like we want to go there to be inspired to be the change that we want to see in the world. That's a big part of our mission statement. It's like we're going to our social networking feed to inspire us, change that we want to see in the world, to posting pictures of our family, posting sustainable solutions that we're doing around our house, uh, whether it be composting or building a biodigestion system, which is a new thing we have going on, turning our human waste, human manure into a usable uh, compost tea and methane to cool. cook with, right? Yeah, that's our new project at our house, which is like really exciting, right? For so sure. many cool solutions going on. Um, and so for me, the reason I really left Facebook is because was just so flooded with misinformation, so flooded with conspiracy theories. Seeing my friends get 
and divisive and hateful and yeah it's crazy so oh the other core rule with our new social network is uh, you can post controversial things approach it with kindness it's like there's no one saying you're brainwashed you know you're brainwashed liberal you're brainwashed right wing wing nut whatever right? but you're brainwashed no you're brainwashed we don't have that going on on our network <laughs> it's like give sources give real information be kind be compassionate try and put yourself in the other person's shoes and understand where they're coming from in their post in their comment and really discuss the topic don't just call names right so what uh, i'm so just going to point out primarily that. So, so the, sure. the Mastodon oh. server you're using, it is a, one of the servers that interoperates to form the greater Fediverse. So this is, in fact, right. the same network we were talking a couple episodes about. But it's interesting that you're, from your perspective so far, you're describing it in terms of the local community. And the, the episode it, that we had a couple of weeks ago, we mostly focused on the network itself with the global perspective where there is really nothing control. The, the moderation happens at the small scale. So if you wanted to like have this censorship free or whatever aspect to it, it's yeah. there. But like, it's there. there's also this possibility for having a vision of how you, never mind you personally, but like your community wants to have their communications going on. And That's right. so your community, it is an active community. It's a, you've built up this trust, you've built up this love between people so far. And you've got this, this working thing that the rest of us can kind of just marvel on as a, almost like a wonder of the world sort of thing. But like, it's interesting that you have all of this, something to defend, right? Where you have, there are threats of waves of misinformation and hate coming from the outside. And you have, so far at least, from the sounds of it, managed to keep some of that from really impacting you. So, well, we just started, oh, okay. I'll tell you that. So yeah, we haven't really launched it. We have a small core group of people posting on there. We're planning on launching it in the next couple of weeks as we get our uh, branding and kind of create our home home page real nice, set our code of conduct real clear. Right now we're going deep into the discussion of our code of conduct though, because well, some people left Facebook because they weren't allowed, because there's not enough conspiracy stuff on there. There's not enough. They're not allowed to post the misinformation stuff that they believe in on Facebook. Whereas like me, I left, I'm like into leaving Facebook because it's just flooded with divisive misinformation, flooded with what I believe to be like nation state funded misinformation campaigns, you know, right. to divide people and cause mistrust of experts, mistrust of one another, just divide and conquer whole thing. That's what I think is going on, you know, and I, so our network is, to me, it's in response to that. There are people on our network that are like, oh, I really want to be posting this stuff. And it's like, what we're saying, what we kind of decided is it's your page. Post whatever you want, follow whoever you want, you can unfollow whoever you want. But the goal of this is to keep it positive, to keep it like uplifting, uh, solutions, personal updates. They can be sad updates too, of course, right. you know, personal stories. But personal, personal, real, solution-based, artistic-based, creative expressions, right? And, and it's the not, one thing it's that not you have in stuff. your community not going for you that allows you to kind of get away with this is I think that mm -hmm. if someone starts to veer into the never mind spreading misinformation part but like the doing it in an unkind way there is someone there that can big difference exactly. like actually intervene on a personal level and like talk to the guy right yeah i would, I would call them yeah, yeah. call them and be they're, like they're there you know this isn't really the jam for our network you can ask about these topics but if you can't be kind to one another with different opinions so that you should find a new network you can move to gab you can move to i don't know there's a dozen networks for like free speech right networks and, and in addition that to that like because it's massive you, you can still communicate with the community right you're yeah, still part of the yeah, broader exactly. diaspora almost of the community but you have this this internal so so i will not mention too that we are using the hometown fork of mastodon okay so the hometown fork allows for instance only posts so i can post publicly just on my instance that's not an option on the normal mastodon the original what's his name eugene eugene Jeans Mastodon <laughs> doesn't allow for instance only posting. If you post something, it automatically federates, right? If you do something publicly. Whereas on Hometown, you can post publicly and just stay within your instant. And there's, uh, was it, contention around that feature? Because <laughs> uh, uh, as we don't want people to have to join our instance to communicate. 
right. people on it. The hometown community, the goal is to create a, a network of trusted instances. So it's like like-minded instances. So that's the eventual goal of hometown, which okay. is kind of a little bit different than Mastodon. Slightly, right? And again, that... As long as the entire network has that choice of right. where, like, you're still able to, like, there are graduations of federation where, like, should people be able to follow each other? Should people be able to communicate with each other unilaterally? Like, is it acceptable for people who don't know you to, it's kind of like email, right? Yeah. Where Google has these filters that they've built for us, but it's certainly plausible to imagine that, oh, hey, should I have the ability to choose whether I can get email from just any old spammer, right? Or should I only be able to get email from my trusted groups and people that maybe other networks have shown as trustworthy? These are the kinds of questions that communities can make, right? Yeah, yeah that's right. And, we, and as with email, it's like you set your spam blocker accordingly. This issue with Twitter going on right now where uh, the president's uh, tweets are getting fact-checked and hidden because inciting violence, things like that. Mastodon kind of has a different approach in that, I mean, honestly, we wouldn't allow Donnie on our network. He, wouldn't, he just wouldn't be allowed on our instance. But he, once he gets kicked off Twitter, he might go and join Gab or it might popularize the Fediverse quite a lot. Who knows? We'll see. What, I mean, I, and we're seeing huge spikes in Fediverse activity right now as it is interesting so uh, but uh, I see a future where we have different fact check API's and whether it's individually you can as a browser plugin you just plug in which fact checking API you trust or you can do multiple or maybe some have conflicting information I don't know maybe there's some open source wiki fact check thing eventually right that is reliable i don't know if that is possible but <laughs> maybe right <laughs> but i would say people have browser extensions and you just plug in whichever fact checking database that you rely on and your fact checking your filtering is done on your side on the client side same right. with mastodon as a community we might be able to in the future plug in a fact check api so that Things are just back checked automatically by the one that so we decide we two trust. kind of things on that. One of them is I've noticed this week uh, one of my friends posted a screenshot of a couple of different fact checking websites. Snopes was oddly enough not one of them, but there were a couple others that were I've seen being used to fact check uh, things that, for example, Donald Trump will say or claims about COVID, that sort of thing. And in both cases, they were talking about the opinion. In that, I saw that post from you. Yeah, yeah, where it was like the oh, the fact checkers themselves have. I mean, it, it's one thing to say, "Hey, this is true. This is not true," or "Hey, this happened. This doesn't happen." But when we start getting into this point where we have these trusted institutional experts, like a, a fact-checking API, that when they start saying, oh, hey, this opinion is uh, out of balance, for example, that starts to, to kind of lead us in a, a little bit of a scary direction. And I'm not sure we are at that. Well, I think when the, uh, when the protocol is implementing the fact-checking, I think that's an issue. Yeah. You know, it should be done client-side. It should be done... By users, so you can filter your own feed. Uh, you don't. We don't. We shouldn't be relying on AI, big corporations, to fact check and filter our feed for us. That seems like the wrong direction to go in. Right. And I know that a Jack from Twitter did retweet something. Uh, Spology Sarasin posted about this specific issue and finding different open source. Well, you know, having many open source options. You choose your API. I think that that's a good direction for that. And yeah, I would probably smile if, uh, what's his name? Donnie gets banned from Twitter too. <laughs> so, so yeah. switching back a little bit. So again, we have a comment from the peanut gallery asking a little bit more about the, uh, the current events going on right now in the States. And again, as someone outside of the United States, I can only see so much, and I can only see the mediated from through media of what's going on. But from your perspective, I've seen a lot of talk about various things. That, for example, the police officer at first who, who murdered this guy wasn't even arrested. He was just kind of let to go. Eventually, I think he got he, he was suspended, and then he was uh, arrested, and now he's been charged with third-degree murder. At least as of when I started recording, I haven't heard of the other two police officers being sanctioned or charged in any way. But other than the obvious, which is bringing the people who did this 
murder to justice, maybe some kind of police reform. What do you see as the end game of where these protests and these little rebellions are going? Some have suggested that it's going right to the top in terms of getting Donald Trump out of the White House. Do you see that as enough? Do you see, where, where do you see, from your perspective, as perhaps a regular American on that side, where this could end? Probably just people leaving the cities, getting more uh, into off-grid living, finding their own uh, sustainable solutions. So, like, the cities themselves are the impossible contradiction. I, that's that's how I feel. I've always been, like, getting out of, get out of the cities, their death trap. That's how I feel. I live in a very rural area, uh, and I grow my own food. I'm on solar power. I catch my water. I harvest the methane from my <laughs> poop, you know, <laughs> to cook with. <laughs> so it's like I'm, I'm into finding, uh, looking for sustainable solutions, building trust with your community, create your own money. I think yeah. maybe a leeway into that. You know, Bitcoin villages, create your own social network. Just and you know, I the US government has already lost their trust in the American you know, we don't the American people don't trust what word comes out of the White House. And we don't trust what comes out of the C D C even. We don't, don't yeah, it's it's so, disappointing. So perhaps the uh, the kind of sum of at least for those outside of the cities. <laughs> The sum of trust, the sum of being able to bypass the violence is, is kind of like the way out from what I'm kind of gathering here. That's that's how I feel. I don't think I think cities are like not sustain not a sustainable way forward. And uh, and maybe they can be overhauled, you know, greenified, you know, uh, plant up rooftop gardens, and I don't know, maybe uh, the, the energy, you know, what underground roads, right? Elon Musk is like bring the roads underground. That could help. Oh, where, where ground level is just for walking, just pedestrians, right? Right. Uh, I mean, those types of things could could help, but it, the congestion is the. The congestion of cities and the lack of agriculture, you know, the supply chains. There's no, you can, there's no supply chain that, sustainability. That, that, cities, that was right? kind of one of the things that kind of came up this week in regards to COVID, where we were. Uh, I was in a discussion where the the question of insulin came up, and right now insulin is not manufactured locally here, and it is certainly there is a long supply chain that extends into the states that we can't produce it, or at least we aren't producing it. It can be very expensive to do so, but again, that's kind of a choice there. Uh, but at the same time, if you look at the curves of what COVID is, which people are dying from COVID, the curve for people who are diabetic is virtually identical as far as age is concerned. And so it's there's this problem of people losing control of their ability to handle blood sugar, to process sugar in the correct way, that gets worse and worse the older you get. And the when we get to this point where we have lots and lots of people living dependent on this external supply chain that extends far into the distance. It's certainly worth thinking about how we can bring that supply chain closer so that in case something really did go wrong, like COVID or these, these rebellions that block that supply chain, we're going to be without it anyway, right? So it's, it's good to have a kind of decentralized source of a lot of things like that. So in the peanut gallery, we should be trying to weed out false information overhauling the human rights systems in the U.S. But again, I, I think you, you kind of put it well in that the U.S. government has lost a lot of credibility, really, and it's going to be hard for them to get that back, if even possible. So I don't know if you have any comment on that. Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah, it's going to be hard for them to get that back. And, you know, it's, and, uh, and it seems like half the country doesn't trust anything the other half says, so that we have kind of that dynamic going on, too, in our country. We really have to be coming together and getting over our political differences to seek local sustainable solutions. Yeah, ignore the politicians. They're just trying to divide and conquer us, like always. <laughs> or the Russians are <laughs> more or less, like more. <laughs> I mean, the Russians and our, I guess our current administration is under that umbrella, you know, yeah. as far as I can tell. And, and there's certainly... I mean, we gotta, yeah, we got to not let these extreme narratives sway us away from loving one another and finding what we have in common. So, as we're slowly getting to the end here, now, you have been involved in the Ripple system. I haven't talked too much about Ripple yet. I'm going to get into the technical details on that, perhaps later. But when did you get involved, and what what is your, from the early days, what, what was your experience 
Sure. So, pretty sure I read the, the white paper, the Ripple white paper written by Ryan Fugger before we had any software. I was pretty excited to find that soft, to uh, play around with the software when it got written finally. Uh, I got more involved during the uh, Occupy movement. There was a lot of uh, messaging going around, Occupy this, Occupy that. Um, and a lot of thinking in terms of like, how could we replace these failed institutions that are producing these terrible outcomes. And that was certainly one of the things that came out of it. Definitely. But yeah, like I saw a page, I remember one page was Occupy the Banks. Uh, do you remember that site or? I don't know. I think but, I um, may have missed that one. I saw Occupy the Banks. Said, what is this? Is, is this a sit-in at Wells Fargo? You know, it's like, no. It's like, it's time for us to become the banks, right? <laughs> we don't need these third-party trust, third-party uh, trusted institutions that nobody trusts too big to fail. We can create our own trust networks. We can create our own trustless networks, right? Like Bitcoin. Right. You know, we don't need third parties to manage our money for us. It's time for us to take these responsibilities back to our own hands. So some of the solutions are, you know, most of them that were listed there don't really, I don't think exist at all anymore. I don't, or some of those old ones got, I don't even remember right now, like the Ripple predecessors. Do you remember any of those? Uh, like, I mean, there was eagle for me, but before, other than that, there were like a bunch of like really little trying to replace the bank's projects. Right. And yeah, and Eagle, Eagle is a great place to start because that was also something I signed up for. I never put money in there, oh, fortunately, because yeah. <laughs> all the, right, it all got confiscated, I believe, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't. That was a cool solution, though. That was a cool idea. So, I mean, that was like the Napster that turned into a BitTorrent, which is <laughs> are now Bitcoin, right? Uh, which grateful to have as a settlement layer. I still believe that credit is the original money and is the money that will always be relevant and always exist as uh, just credit and well, it, I know it's just like saying you know yeah. trust will always exist between human beings right we, right we we can't coexist as human beings without some degree of trust and being able to use that trust to actually act in the real world that is what credit is at the end of the day is having this formalized version of trust and whether it's in a network like Ripple or whether it's in something else, maybe a little bit more impersonal like money or Bitcoin, we're going to keep reinventing this idea of trust in different ways and in ways that work for the people who need it. Because if it doesn't work properly, we're just going to try again over and over and over again. And so now as far as we, I think we're starting to get near the end here. Now, is there any last, I guess, words that you'd like to spread to the world? Some message of peace or some way of uh, centering ourselves in this, these times? Let me see here. Well, yeah, I did want to, let's see, I want to follow up on the Ripple Bitcoin thing a little bit and I'll leave point of peace as well. So, <laughs> but uh, I've always thought that the combination of credit or a decentralized credit network like Ripple or Villages IO in combination with Bitcoin seems like uh, ideal. Because Bitcoin is, is like a settlement layer and work as a settlement layer for credit credit networks. And they're really, I think they work really well together. A credit is something that anybody can create anywhere in the world, whether you're in sub-Saharan Africa or in, uh, I don't know, isolated island, you know, in, in the middle of the Pacific. <laughs> you know, we're, well, you, we might not have gold here, we might not have bitcoins here, we might not have dollars here, but we can still create credit networks and still trade credit. So that, that's what I want to leave you with on the note of Ripple and Credit so so uh, I, I find kind of interesting when you put it that way, how similar it is to the relationship between your instance on the Fediverse and the rest of the Fediverse, where it's like we have this ability to create communities around us and to, to learn to trust and love one another in the local level. And in your case, it's codified with this software, but it's also interoperable with this broader network that's there that allows the broad scale, the large scale human uh, interaction to occur that isn't always going to be on as friendly of a terms as your little community goes. But it's worth thinking about both sides of that. And again, going back to the COVID thing, we can, as a species, deal with COVID. We can, if we act correctly, the whole world could be like Hawaii. It's miraculous. It's miraculous that humans have that ability. We I'm do. Like, I just think that's amazing. And we have this ability to work together on that scale. And we have been working together on that scale to some extent for the past couple of months. Can we do things on a, a smaller scale that will help or hurt that effort? 
Absolutely. Can we do stuff that will help or hurt the people in our immediate lives? Absolutely. But I, I think we, we really, anyone who's listening to this right now, please try to pay attention to your impact both on both scales of what you're doing, the actions you're doing, and how they are impacting the people around you and globally. Because I think we really do need that reminder this week. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, end for the day. Just as a reminder, I do have a subscribe star uh, if you want to help support this particular show and encourage it to continue to exist. Subscribestar.com slash Jeff Dash Cliff. And I will uh, fade out with a song uh, this week. I've got a song. This is actually an old song uh, that was sung by m millions of people, I'm sure, in revolutionary movements all across the, the Europe and in Russia. It was the anthem that brought the Tsar down. It was the anthem that people in revolutions would sing. An 8-bit version. L'Internationale, if I'm pronouncing that correct. And I'll see you all hey, next week. Thanks so much, Jeff. Hey, I'll, I'll say, think globally, act locally. There we go. Perfect words to end by.
by now. I thought the pardon was the time. I expect the evening for getting the time. I can't deny. But now goodbye. Goodbye now. Goodbye now. Goodbye. The trip by taxi wasn't far. We'd linger longer if I had a car. advantage to all reasons. It brings about a special kiss. I hope that there's eternally a momentary party just a second and we're starting. Oh, goodbye now. Goodbye now. It's just a moment we're apart. Just a moment, we're up.